the hired man. So uh, I knew it would happen that uh, when I set a book outside uh, mm -hmm. West Africa, that every time I did an interview, people would say, well, why Croatia? But uh, my answer is two things, why not? Um, I mean, because it seemed to me completely obvious, really, that I would at some point leave Sierra Leone. I wasn't going to set every book for the rest of my life in Sierra Leone. <laughs> uh, but secondly, that there were shared themes there that uh, could translate across. And I guess the other thing is that actually, you know, they, they may as well have asked me, well, why Sierra Leone? You know, I mean, actually, I'm half Scottish. I have not been particularly moved to write about Aberdeen <laughs> yet. <laughs> but if Aberdeen had a war, <laughs> I might, uh, as opposed to simply a referendum uh, on, <laughs> on independence. Um, I might. The reason I wrote about Sierra Leone in the first instance was because we had a war. That was why. You know, I had grown up there. I had a history with that country. My father had been a political prisoner there, and I had a story to tell. But it was really only when I saw the connection between our story in the 1970s, my father's activism, his imprisonment, his time as a, as a political prisoner, and his uh, prophecies, really, before he died about what was going to happen in the country. He said, this will end in war. If we carry on this way, this will end in war. And so with the devil that danced on the water, I wrote a book which asked the simple question, how does a country implode? How does a country go from so much hope to such sorrow? And with the memory of love, I wrote a book which said, well, if one man saw it, how come other people didn't see it? Or did they see it and perhaps choose not to act? Um, Paul Klee, the artist, has said that when he draws a picture, he is taking a line for a walk, which is rather lovely. So lovely, I decided to pinch it. <laughs> and I now consider that when I write a novel, I take a thought for a walk. So I take a thought for the longest possible walk I can. And the thought, how does a country implode, uh, I walked it around and about Sierra Leone for a bit, and then I asked the question, you know, well, how does somebody who doesn't act justify? How do they account for themselves later on to the next generation when that country has, um, has imploded? And then I took my thought for a walk, and I took it outside Sierra Leone, and I took it to a country which had also had a civil conflict, to see what the differences and similarities were. I knew there were a great many similarities, and I'll tell you briefly why I chose Croatia. Um, I was still interested in, interested in civil conflict, and I was going to and from Sierra Leone a lot over the last decade, a couple of times a year, partly, of course, like many people who had family there. We were all part of the rebuilding um, but secondly, I was writing a lot about Sierra Leone. I had projects that I was running there. So I was going to and from the country quite a lot. And one day I um, went, I mean, this would happen quite typically, but I went for lunch and I realized that I was sitting in a room with somebody who had been accused of a number of killings in the country. Alleged killings. Well, they were killed allegedly. He had been involved. And I thought to myself, you know, this happens quite a lot. I mean, it certainly happens to my family a lot that we find ourselves in a room uh, with people who helped kill my father. That much we've got used to. But now the whole country is doing this. I go up to my family town of Maborka. Our village is about 12 uh, miles outside Maborka. And I go to Maborka, and there are houses there that are still occupied by young men who were part of the rebel forces, who did terrible things to the people of that town. And they still occupy the houses. Who knows what has happened to the original residents? But they haven't either felt they can claim their houses, or perhaps they're no longer alive to come and claim their houses. Um, I know from the stories that my family in their village tell me that you know, they pass 
every day going for water, a woman can pass a man who raped her. So we live side by side with all of this. It happened on the day that I was in this restaurant where I used to stop and have my lunch and where there were many people, um, many people who'd probably done all sorts of things during the war, but in particular this one person who had been accused of a number of killings. And later on, uh, a British person came to me and he said that he'd been in the restaurant and you know, we'd met and said hello, he'd spoken to a number of people. And he said, oh, you know, everyone here is so lovely. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, yes, we are. Aren't we? I mean, I do think so, Aliens are lovely. But at the same time, I did think, hmm, you know, we're so used to the elephant in the room that sometimes we forget it's there. You don't even know there's an elephant in the room. And I became really fascinated by this idea. You see, an idea comes, doesn't let you go. I call them, I call them the, um, the sparks of fire. You know? And over years, I'll get one, two, three. And then eventually, something like a bushfire is going in my brain. And I start thinking, here's a book I want to write. This is a book now. You know, it's more than a thought that's gone for a walk. It's met some other thoughts, and now they're marching. And um, so um, I thought, what would it be like to go to a country which you cannot read? Uh, you may or may not know something awful has happened there. And in fact, the, the man who spoke to me did know something had happened there. So you know, his brain was obviously operating on some other level of consciousness. Um, I thought, what's it like? I can read the country. I know who to avoid, I know who did what, I know who to be afraid of. You know, I know not to go and confront those guys in the book or who in those houses, you know, I know who they are. But what if you didn't? And the, the memory of love had played with that a little bit with the character of Adrian who goes to this country and doesn't know how to read it. And I wanted to extend that thought and I wanted to put myself in a place where I didn't necessarily know how to read the country. So I began to think about where this might be. Um, it came to the former Yugoslavia and Croatia in particular because one evening in London uh, I was invited to a party. I was at a party given by some Croatian and Bosnian friends of mine and I had brought some Sierra Leonean friends. Um, they had arrived off the plane in deep snow with insufficient garments. <laughs> so there we were. I think they much wanted to go back into the snow again because <laughs> it was so cold. Uh, anyway, we, we were at this party, and it went on for quite a while. And at some point, we started to talk about our wars. We started to talk about the conflict in, in, in the former Yugoslavia and Sierra Leone. And I was really, really struck by how similar our experiences were. And the thing that united us all, that we wanted to talk about whether we had physically lived through it, or lived through it by remote through family and friends, where the people had actually served in the army or actually managed to be overseas when it happened. But the thing that um, all of us had in common, the thought we couldn't shake, was that people we knew had done terrible things. You know, people we'd been at school with, particularly the uh, ex-Yugoslavs, the Bosnians, were saying people they had been to school with had ended up running some of those camps uh, where the Bosnian Muslims were held um, and, and quite possibly torturing those inmates uh, for long periods of time. So I, it occurred to me that I might set a book there and I began to look at that country, began to read about it and read about the war. It was a very complicated war. As you all remember, I mean, especially the macro politics of it, the way it was reported, um, um, left a lot of people in the West behind as to exactly why all these things were happening and who was on which side. So I spent some time teasing all of that apart. And I know anyway that when I write a book, I mean, my books are about character. They're not about countries. Um, literary writers write books about people who happen to live in those countries. Uh, otherwise, I would write a work of non-fiction, a historical work. So... I knew that I had to understand the macropolitics, but it wasn't about that, it was about the, 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 the people themselves. And then uh, where things became really uh, decided um, on, well, specifically on Croatia as opposed to any other of the ex-Yugoslav countries, 
was when I came across an advertisement in a British newspaper for holiday homes in Croatia. And this is a country that had experienced ethnic cleansing. And I thought, wow, you know? I mean, first of all, no one's buying holiday homes in Sierra Leone. <laughs> so they obviously, and people, when I go to Sierra Leone, would always ask me, is it safe? Is it all right? You know, so I wanted to break this kind of other, other ring of Africa that somehow we were the only people who had wars. Um, but secondly, I was quite taken aback at how quickly, obviously, second homeowners were able to set aside the events in Croatia and avail themselves of the cheap housing stock there. So um, I, I decided that I wanted to write about somebody who goes to that country and buys a house. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, actually, what I really want to do, because the sort of person who does that is somebody who's clearly decided not to see something or that they don't care about something. I mean, if you bought a house in a country like that, you'd sure want to do a lot of provenance on uh, you know, its previous ownership and um, potentially these were the kinds of people who did not. So I thought about the people that, are, that such a house buyer might encounter. And of course, one of the things that happens when we go and buy a house anywhere, an old house, is it has to be done up. And, you know, when you think about your house, who do you let in the door without any question at all? The plumber, the guy who does the electricity, the cable guy. And I thought, who, if you go to a, an overseas country, uh, who do you let in the door without any question? It's going to be the builder. So I decided that this would be a relationship I could explore. It had many elements, you know, nationality, culture, class, knowing, not knowing, particularly knowing and not knowing. So I decided to write the book in the voice of a local man. His name is Dura Kolak, a local man who witnesses uh, a British family buying and moving into a house uh, near him and he offers himself, he needs the work of course, this is rural Croatia and work is hard to find, he offers himself as a handyman to help do up the house. Duro knows things that have happened in the town that the family are unaware of. Um, the last thing I'll say before I give the first reading is that um, I had a friend, I have a friend, who was a war correspondent, and I asked him about his experience of reporting from the Kraina, um, which is where the hired man is set. I asked him about his experience of reporting there during the war, and he told me where to go, and he helped me focus my uh, initial research. One of the things he said in passing he said, you know, the reason that war kicked off so fast is because most of the former Yugoslavia is composed of rural communities and they're hunting communities. And every man in that world owns a gun and knows how to use it. So when the call to arms came, the whole thing kicked off incredibly quickly. And of course, when I went off and thought about it, I thought that he was right or oh, it certainly explained something to me about the speed of uh, the race to war in the former Yugoslavia. But the other thing I thought was, of course, that is why that war was characterized by sniper fire. It was characterized by siege and snipers, think Sarajevo. And then I thought about Sierra Leone, and we were characterized by what? Amputations, right? And what were we? Farmers. And what did we have? Cutlasses. And, you know, when I had the thought, I thought, why did I not see that before? It became <laughs> so evident. But that people fight with the thing that they have. And this is Duro Kolak, the hunter. 
At sundown, I walked the dogs on the hills. The lights of Gost separated me from a vast darkness. The sea, two hours' drive away. Zeka picked up a scent and ran ahead with her nose to the ground, cobs behind. I left them for a short while to see where they were headed and then called them to heel before they could disappear into the pine plantation. Together, we entered the trees. Inside, it was closer. Tonight, the pine needles were soft underfoot, soundless. There is a place where the deer gather on the other side of the plantation and the trees give way to a clearing. At about 50 metres from our destination, I told the dogs to go down and wait for me, which they did, sinking slowly to their haunches. They liked to pretend they didn't care, Cousin Zeka, but under the skin, every nerve and muscle twitched. I moved slowly forward, balancing my weight on the outside edges of my feet. Every ten steps, I stopped and listened. In the silence of the forest, I counted on hearing the deer before I saw them, and so it happened, a group of eight grazing at the edge of the clearing. A young doe lifted her head at my approach. I froze. She glanced about nervously before she lowered her head again. Six does, two bucks. The bucks were younger, less than a year old, probably. The doe who'd raised her head was closest to me, perhaps three years old. I lifted my rifle, set my sights on her, and released the safety catch. She grazed on, her body angled away from me. I watched and waited. She might have sensed me, for she lifted her head a second time and looked to the left and right and then in my direction. An ear twitched. Neither of us moved. Then she relaxed and lowered her head. Reaching for another morsel, she shifted her footing and presented her broadside to me. I placed the crosshair at her temple, took a deep breath, exhaled, squeezed the trigger, and watched her drop. At the sound of the gun, the rest of the deer fled. Cos and Zeka were at my side, ready to follow the blood trail if there was one. But I didn't need them today. She'd fallen exactly where she'd stood. The sky had turned to a deep blue and it was too dark now to dress her in the woods. So I hoisted her onto my shoulder and headed, headed in the direction of home. For two days, my thoughts had been crowded by memories of Kreshemir and of Anka. It felt as though I had been lifted up and set back in that time, the events of which I'd found a way to live with. I'd had no choice, none of us had, though some were better at it than others. Now I remembered how here, where the ravine meets the pine trees, we'd seen our first bull. Anka. Wearing yellow pop socks, stands upon a rock, showing off her balance. On tiptoe, her arms above her head like a dancer in a musical box. Slowly, she extends one leg behind her, an arm in front. She's wearing a yellow skirt which matches her socks and it ruffles in the breeze. Otherwise, she is impressively still. I have opened my mouth to cheer when I see her expression, and follow her line of sight to the first row of trees. There, in the no-man's land of shadows and sunlight, a boar, huge. Slowly I raise my gun and take aim. I miss, thank God, because the gun is a pea-shooter and would doubtless only have made him mad. The bullet ricochets off a tree. The great beast shudders, regards us a moment longer, and is gone. Anka jumps off the rock and into my arms. We walk home exultant. Nobody bothers to mention that I really shot a tree and not a boar. Kreshemir and I are 14 and Anka is 10. The year is 1975. I stood and inhaled the cold scent of the pine, the base note of leaf mold, made all the more powerful by the darkness. I closed my eyes and tried to imagine 1975 and then opened them before a picture could come. I whistled for Cos and Zeka 
and we returned by way of the road. Light flared between the shutters of the blue house. I stood on the road facing the house, the warm corpse of the deer over my shoulder, the dog silent by my side. Somebody, Laura, crossed in front of an upstairs window. I stood there for some minutes more until Cos spoke. <clears throat> A soft whine, and we turned towards home. I lay awake thinking about the past, things I hadn't thought about for years. Somewhere nearby, the vixen called an awful sound. I'd seen her. She came some night circling the houses to search for scraps to take back to her half-grown cubs. And drawn that night by the scent of the deer I'd dressed in the yard a couple of hours before. She taunted the dogs and the dogs answered, racing up and down their pen, barking and howling, clawing the wire mesh. Next morning, the Tuesday, I arrived early at the blue house. In my hand, I held a chisel. A few years after the house first became empty, somebody had plastered and whitewashed a section of the facade. The job had been hastily done. I checked nobody was around and then I scraped at a layer of the plaster, loosening a portion which I pulled away with my fingers. I stood there for a few minutes, scraping and tossing lumps of plaster into the tall grass. I stopped and stood back. Now you could see a part of what lay beneath, a patchwork of small blue and green tiles made of glass and clay, the same as the ones lying on my windowsill. Inside, Laura was talking on her mobile phone. The day was clear and the sky pale blue. On many days, the mountains blocked the reach of the mobile networks, but that day, the invisible force field that seemed to surround Gost so much of the time had lifted. Laura pointed to the phone in her hand and mouthed something to me, then waved a hand at the coffee pot on the table next to a single cup. She left to finish her call upstairs. No sign of either the son or the daughter. I carried my coffee outside and set to work, removing paint from the windowsills. An hour on, Laura came out to see how I was doing, then left to go into town. When she came back, I set down my tools to help her carry the groceries from the car. More coffee, which we carried outside again. Laura turned her face to the sun, closed her eyes for a few seconds, and then opened them again to take a sip of her coffee. Her eyes roamed the front of the house. When she noticed the place on the wall where I'd scraped away the plaster, she stood up and went over to inspect it, running her fingertips across the tiles. I watched her for a bit. I said, what is it? There's something under here, she replied. It looks like a mosaic. Hi, I'm Inata. I'm Takumba. It's such a great pleasure to meet you. I'm so honored right now to see you. And as Thank a British you. Nigerian, it's like it's also great to hear another British accent in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love, 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 love the memory of love. I just reread it a couple of weeks ago and it's such a vivid story and I mean, when you talked about, like, at the beginning of your talk and you mentioned about the war in um, Syria alone and the interconnectedness of people and how, you know, sometimes you can go places and you know people who have done things, it really made things so much clearer for me in terms of what I read in the book. One thing I wanted to ask you was, actually two things, um, about the memory of love. Kai was, like, such a brilliant young man. He was a talented young man, but he had such brilliance in him. But at the same time... You know, he was such re he was so resolute that he was not going to leave Sierra Leone. And I kind of wanted to know why. I mean, towards the end, you know, he made moves to like emigrate to America, but then eventually didn't. So I just wanted to know why you were so keen, because someone like that would have excelled so well outside of that country. I mean, he did exceptionally well, given <clears throat> the scope of what was happening in the country. But I just wanted to know why that particular character. And also, I was kind of interested in why you made the love interest both Kai's and Adrian's, even though they had that oh friendship. Oh, she's giving it all away. <laughs> I'm going to have this. Oh I'm imagining that thing. How can I answer this question without a total plot spoiler? <laughs> okay. All right, so, and then the second question was about your um, 
autobiography about your dad. My and memoir, also yeah. Your memoir about the um, moving from places to places as a child. Um, I wanted to know, um, cause again, you know, the story is so vivid and some of your memories are so, like, vivid when you talk about, like, watching the ants and... But, yeah, your, some other memories are not so clear for you. So I wanted to know, um, what was it like growing up, having that experience of moving from places to places? And at what stage in your life did things become more, I guess, settled? And how long did it take for you to, like, grow out of resenting your parents for having put you through that in a way? Oh, well, I never did resent them, so it took me no time at all to do that. But, uh, I mean, I understood what my parents were doing. Uh, and I think that's important for children. If you understand what your parents are doing and why they're doing it, um, I think you're, you're unlikely to or, or less likely to build any kind of resentment. Also, bear in mind, I had nothing to compare it to. So, you know, the, the idea that one might grow up with a white picket fence in a house with a Labrador was not something that had ever been presented to me. Um, ha, you know, was my, has my life settled? I, no, it hasn't. Uh, I mean, I, I have owned the same house for a long time. That is true. Um, but, you know, I think increasingly, I think we're probably going to have to rethink the idea that has become common currency that people grow up and live and die in the same place. There are so many of us who move around for all kinds of different reasons. I was at the Jaipur Literature Festival in January and I chaired a session called The Global Soul. And you know, there was nobody on that stage who probably didn't own about three passports and had moved in to various countries for different reasons. Sometimes they had left because of war and emigrated. Sometimes they had gone abroad to study. Sometimes they had parents from different countries. Um, so I think we're probably going to have to, 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 to shift that, um, that perception that one is a normality and one is not a normality. We're going to have to um, redefine what, what we consider normal. I have decided I don't want to be any other way. I actually really like the fact that I grew up between cultures, albeit it takes a lot of explaining, and albeit <laughs> that one has to do a lot of cultural interpretation for other people. Um, it is an extraordinary gift to have at this time. You know, when cultures are constantly trying to talk to each other, to have grown up doing it has turned into an extraordinary gift. And what you discover is there's a language, I mean, not a literal language, but a way of seeing, whereby you can, I can now see, almost between an Ethiopian and a Japanese, why, at what point they're not connecting, you know, that what they're not hearing that the other person's saying. Um, and I think that is something that grows out of growing up on the crossroads of cultures, in between cultures. You begin, you begin to see and, and interpret the way that people speak to each other, and you listen with a different and more acute ear. It doesn't mean to say you have to grow up the way I did to be able to do it, but it helps. Um, so uh, I now, you know, I mean, I, 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 as I say, when I was a kid, I didn't know any different, and I now like the way I am. And tell you what else is really good about it. You never get homesick. <laughs> you never get homesick. I travel all the time. And I, I, it, this is something else I took for granted. I, ha I have seen homesickness in people and culture shock in people. And it's actually very arresting. And I, you know, it is. It, it, it is. It really is. I, you know, I, 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 I've taught students who've been scholarship students from one country and come to another. And they've just found it really, really, really difficult to adapt to the place they're in. And it's ended up threatening their studies. So... Uh, you know, I, I, in the end, I've decided, or, or on uh, going through it, I decided it was a fact of life. I've now decided that it's more a gift than anything else. Uh, to answer the questions about the memory of love, it's a bit trickier because, ooh, plot spoiler. You have to put your fingers in your ears if you haven't read the memory of love. Kai is conflicted about staying and going. Right, he is conflicted about staying and going. And if he goes... He gets a lot of benefits to his career, including a lot more money, doesn't he? Uh, he also can um, advance his techniques as a surgeon. He's a young surgeon. So he wants to go for those reasons, and his best friend has already left the country and gone to work in America, as so many do. However, 
when I am in Sierra Leone, I observe all the time there are many people who have no wish to leave their country. And even the ones who do leave their country, actually, if they had the opportunities at home, at home wouldn't go either. So <laughs> I thought it was important to think about that and to ask readers to think about that. And Kai is the character I chose. And his great love was Mama Kay. And Mama Kay was very clear that she wanted to stay where she was born. So um, that's about as much as I'm going to tell you about why, uh, without giving away too much of the plot. But I, I, you know, I think it is important to understand more people stay than leave. More people stay than leave, and they, and they stay because they want to, because they love their countries, their families, their homes. I think you do have yeah. to. Yeah, I rather wonder where she was going, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, firstly, thank you for coming out tonight. My um, pleasure. It was really good to speak. Um, I'm a student at American University. I'm studying creative writing. And I just, you noted earlier that uh, you said writers, or literary writers don't write about the countries themselves and the settings. They write about the people within the countries. Um, but as a fiction writer, um, do you allow for the setting and the country, in the case of this book, um, take on a form of life in itself within the writing? And if so, how does that shape the characters within the story? Yeah. Setting is not unimportant to the literary writer. It, it can, as you suggest, be a character in itself. Um, it's simply that as uh, literary writers, we tend to be character-driven as opposed to plot fiction, the plot-driven. Um, when I think about my setting, uh, wherever it is, um, I think very hard about how people are affected by their environment. So I think very hard with somebody like Duro. Uh, how has he lived in that place? The former Yugoslavia had most of the things uh, that the developing world did not. Electricity, running water, although the rural communities didn't have running water. Um, you know, when, I, when I've spoken to people from that world, Actually, we see many more similarities uh, in terms... You know, they, they do say that they had those rudimentary things, but then they, were, they had freedoms, which the uh, populations of the Soviet bloc didn't. But they couldn't exercise those freedoms on the whole because they were quite poor. So they, had, they could theoretically all travel to Italy or um, Britain or wherever, but actually in practice, rather like the de population of developing countries, they couldn't, they didn't have any money. So I, I, I thought about that. He's lived this life which is quite constrained, but he has the freedom of his ideas. He is a very self-sufficient man because he's a rural man. Uh, you know, he knows how to fix. He's got all those life skills that you would have if you grew up in a place like that. You know, he knows how to fit out a well. He knows how to put in, install a pump, restore a car, things I had to learn <laughs> in order to write his character. Um, and skills we've all lost. So Duro is incredibly efficient. Um, and the, the last thing about Duro, of course, is, is he knows how to handle a gun. So when we think about Duro within his environment as a hunter, um, he is a, quite a solitary character. He's capable of being very solitary. He's capable of being very in command of himself, of his emotions. One of the things I did when I was researching his character was go and learn to shoot. I went and learned to shoot a, several rifles. And the man who taught me was a former police marksman. This is in Britain, where learning to shoot is actually incredibly difficult because we have very, very, very strict gun control. So it, it took me months just to find some, a place and a person uh, with all the necessary bits of paper <laughs> signed and approved, um, which I had to get as well. Uh, I had my, my good character testified to. I had to have a police check. Um, uh, but this marksman taught me to shoot, and you know, the first time I fired the gun, it almost knocked me off my feet. It was a huge military <laughs> weapon, and it almost knocked me off my feet. By the time he finished teaching me, I could hit a bullseye at one kilometer. What it took for me to do that was to become the way that Duru eventually became. Right, and that's how Duru, that's when I wrote the character, I knew how he was going to be because you have to be utterly still. You can't flinch, you can't, you know, you have to be still for a very long time. And when they talk about uh, 
people shooting, especially very good shots, they talk about them going into the zone, and you can see people doing it, because I eventually began to shoot with other people. We'd all be lying on the grass in the cold, waiting our turn. <laughs> 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 there were times when they were having more fun than I was. But, um, and, and, you know, and then every now and again, you'd see somebody getting ready to take a shot, and, and, and he or she would go into the zone. Um, so I thought that about Duro, and I remember that my instructor told me this fact that I found absolutely compelling. When sports psychologists who go to coach um, Olympic sharpshooting teams, or well, one in particular, started to look exactly, you know what they do, they analyze exactly how somebody, I, I don't know, swims, dives, uh, kicks a football, shoots. So what they were doing was they were looking exactly at how the sharpshooters, um, when they aimed for the target, uh, what the sequence of events was. And they did all sorts of things, hooked them up to uh, uh, heartbeat monitors and, and, and brain waves and all kinds of patterns and all kinds of things, took those all down. And the thing they noticed, which the sharpshooters didn't know, was that they, took, they pulled the trigger between heartbeats. And I thought that was completely fascinating. And that was how I knew what kind of person. A lot of men can shoot, women can shoot. In his world, a lot of men shoot. But Duro shoots brilliantly, and therefore he was going to have to be that kind of person, the sort of person who shoots between heartbeats. Um, thank you very much for that reading. Um, uh, and I wanted to say that I, too, am a huge fan of Memory of Love. I haven't yet read Hired Man, but I cannot wait. Um, and I teach African literature at American University. Um, and also, I, I'll say that my students, um, it, the Memory of Love was the favorite of, oh, <laughs> of the semester. Um, they, just, they just loved it. Um, and I'm very, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I want to say that I'm, I'm actually, I'm not teaching the class this semester, but I'll teach it next fall. And I'm very excited um, about the, to include the hired man in a class on African literature and to have that discussion about what is African literature and to, and to push those, those bounds. And we, we had the discussion a little bit um, when um, Tope Falorin won the Kane Prize and you know people say, oh, well, he doesn't live in, in Nigeria. He's visited there a couple times. The place, you know, the, the, the story takes place in, in Texas. Um, and, it was, and it was interesting to see students kind of you know, start to think, oh, wait, what, what is African literature? And then they want to say, oh, well, you know, is, is Joseph, is Conrad African literature? Is Dave Edgar, Ever, Edgar like, you know, if, if you can be, if African literature can be something that, you know, somebody writes, you know, about a different place. So anyway, I'm, I'm saying this to, to sort of ask you to weigh in so that when I, when I <laughs> teach these students and I hope to see you in a, in a class, um, I can say, well, you know, uh, what Forna says about <laughs> what, uh, no, but I'm actually curious to, to hear you um, weigh in and, and on this what, is one what that, you know. Yeah, this is one that doesn't have a resolution. I mean, the only thing I will say, since I have a Scottish mother and I was born in Scotland, I'm waiting for the day that I get taught in a Scottish literature class. <laughs> um, <laughs> all handles are, are clumsy. And the African literature handle works and doesn't work in different arenas. So, you know, in Gugi Wachiungu, we know, uh, insisted on taking away English literature and calling it literature. And I guess a lot of the problem does start with the English, actually, and this construct of English literature, because as other uh, 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 countries began to produce their own canons of work, particularly first America, um, I guess English literature didn't want them included in the canon. So then we started getting American literature departments and French, well, that's a different language, but a comparative literature, African literature, because that, so much of that literature uses English. So I think it started in academia. I suspect very strongly this, this classification started in academia. Some writers accept it, and I accept it under certain circumstances. I think that um, Achebe said, well, there, he conceded there was such a thing as African literature because the countries had an interconnected history. So I think when we're trying to grasp the rather unwieldy sense of people from those shared histories, writing about that shared histories or setting stories within it, 
Um, then I, I'm, I'm okay about the term African literature, but I, I think it's better than post-colonial literature, I have to say, because, you know, it's like, who are you putting at the center? I mean, you know, we don't like post, I don't know anyone who likes post-colonial literature, because that's putting the colonist at the center. Um, but I'll, I'll accept African literature under those circumstances, but in a bookshop, I am a lot less happy. <laughs> and I, I was in, in fact, I started this a little conversation about this on, um, on Facebook because I had gone to a bookshop in New York and I found the hired man under African literature. So I went to the front desk and I said, okay, this is a book set in the former Yugoslavia, written by a Scot. So, <laughs> being a bit provocative, uh, why is it under? And uh, what was quite funny was that the manager or the assistant was trying to be was very helpful she was very lovely about it you could see her picking up the book and walking off and thinking where am I going to put it that she's going to be all right with <laughs> and in the end she said where do you want it put? <laughs> and I said I will accept British literature for this it went under I wanted it moved because you know if you're looking if you have gone into a bookshop and you are looking for a book on if you are looking for a book on the ex-Yugoslavia, you're not going to look in the Africa section. So it's certainly not serving the purposes of the readers. Uh, it's not serving my purposes, because I want people to read my books. Um, and actually, when I put this up on Facebook, every writer said they wanted alphabetical order. In a bookshop, they want alphabetical order, and that is it. Nobody wanted the, the uh, um, sections. So, uh, yeah, I'll take a, 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 a sort, of, sort of cop out, which is I kind of understand and accept why in terms of trying to see connections um, in, uh, in an intellectual sense, one is going to use the term African writer. It is going to be less and less effective, clearly. But actually, so were the other, so were other terms, you know. Um, I'm not really sure what a British writer is anymore. I'm not really sure what an American writer is anymore. Um, when I was actually, I teach at Williams College, and I was interested to go, I went to the library there, and I found myself along with Hari Kunzru um, and Monica Ali under British literature. You know, so Indian, uh, uh, Bangladeshi, African heritage writer, but all living and working in Britain. I do take the view that Britain is where I am domiciled, where I pay my tax, where I'm resident. So um, on, the, on the basis of that, if, if I have to have a default, I'd say I was a British writer.